on this episode, how to make a phantom flower marble. On the torch again. Just can't wait to get on the torch again. The life I love is making marbles with my friends. And I can't wait to get on the torch again. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me on the Marblehead Show, episode four, where we are going to watch a video on how to make this marble, which is what I call a phantom flower marble. As the story goes, back in 2005, I created a semi-instructional DVD on how to make this marble. And I was really proud of this project back in the day. Basically, I designed the marble specifically to make a DVD. And um, so in the evening hours, I made the same marble over and over and over again. I think I made like nine of the same exact marbles and I kept changing the, the angle of the camera and then um, cut and pasted together this, this instructional and um, released the DVD, sold a bunch of copies. It was all great. And then many years later, when I sort of watch it, Parts of it I'm super proud of and um, I, I think is great and then other parts sort of make me kind of cringe and uh, the parts that make me cringe was the audio. Um, a lot of the music selection and the voiceover, all of that. So anyways, because of that, I had been hesitant to show off this video and share it as much as I'd really like. So now with the Marblehead show, it dawned on me that the, the demonstration itself probably has a lot of value for uh, beginner marble makers or people who are maybe have certain um, marble skills already, but they're looking to incorporate some new ones like fuming and using tubing to do sort of these, uh, I guess they would be considered a form of an implosion. Taking a tube of glass, fuming the inside of the tube, drawing some decoration with a clear rod, and then collapsing the tube to become a solid marble. It's virtually inside out work. Uh, then imploded into a, a solid to make an orb. So I thought, hey, I have an idea. Why don't I show this video? And instead of showing also the audio, the part that I sort of am not super thrilled about here, you know, 12 years later, um, I'm gonna drop the audio out and then I'm just going to watch the video with you and do commentary. So that should be fun. So let's do that. I should explain that the techniques shown in this video are considered advanced and it is not wise for an inexperienced flame worker to attempt them. Inside out work and metal fuming can be very dangerous and harmful. This video does not go into depths in regards to safety or specific techniques including pulling points, inside out work, and fuming, all of which require special care and learning. It is best to have experience and be comfortable with all three of these techniques before attempting this marble. I didn't have the heart to cut that audio out. I mean, I don't think you'll ever find a more passionate disclaimer for liability <laughs> ever. So, had to keep that in. Hi, I'm Tim Kaisers. This is a phantom flower marble. Ugh, it's so hard to see myself from back then. So unhealthy. So this video has been officially introduced. Got to take care of yourself, you guys. Lots of fruits and vegetables, exercise, drink lots of water. Don't drink so much alcohol. You know, you know the drill. All right, so here we go. All right, well, I'm going to start by pulling a point, a blank of 38 millimeter heavy wall tubing. And this isn't really how I normally pull my points exactly. I remember I was trying to keep in the frame of the video, so please don't look at this as an instructional on how to pull points. So flame cut it. My best advice for people who are just pulling points or learning how to pull points is that like, if I was gonna make five marbles, I would pull all five of my points. It's like repetition. Um, so now I'm gonna open up the end of this tubing. I should point out too that the other end of this handle is opened. So you don't want to close off both ends of a tube. So I just remove a little bit of, of glass from the tip of the tube there, creates a thin spot. Now I'm going to heat up that thin spot till it's white hot and plunge it with a seven millimeter rod and it thins out the glass to where it basically pops that 
tube open. It's my preferred method for opening up the end of a tube quickly. Now I'm going to close off the end of the uh, handle there because I'm going to eventually be shooting a flame into this tube. And if you don't have the, uh, the other end of your handle closed off, then it'll allow that, that heat to go down that tube and it will heat up that tube so much that it'll be very uncomfortable. So now I'm going to flare this, this tube open with my graphite octagon reamer. And I'm not going to flare it open any more than I have to, but I am going to make sure there's a little bit of a, a bell flare on the end of this. And that's going to be very practical in, in helping protect my hand because of this weird angle of virtually shooting the, the flame right towards your hand. That, that bell flare will, add, will, will act as a deflector of that flame. So it's really important to have that little bit. Other than that, I'm not going to uh, flare it out any more than I need to because I'm going to have to close it eventually. So now that there's a good heat base and the inside of that tube is nice and warm, I'm going to apply some gold fuming. So I go pretty heavy with the gold. Do a little flame adjustment here for the silver. Just a little more of a reducing flame. Just very slight adjustment. And then I go really light with the silver. So pretty much heavy gold, light silver. Now that the inside of this tube is, is fumed, I'm going to draw a pattern with this 4 millimeter clear rod. And you can really mix up these designs. I mean, experiment. And also, you can do some fume prep of that 4 millimeter rod, uh, twist some fuming in there, and make some kind of like filigrees or twisted canes and, and do these same designs. And uh, you can get all sorts of crazy cool results. So the first thing I'm going to do is put four dots in there, try to space them evenly. And then I'm going to draw a little L shape uh, going in between and on top of these dots. I try to not touch any of my lines together. It's really important to have the four millimeter rod hot enough to where it's just, um, a, it's laying on the glass very smoothly and getting a good contact with that tubing. You're not trying to force it. That's when you hurt yourself is when you are using too much muscle on this glass. The heat should be doing all the work. And now I'm gonna put dots, uh, eight dots of clear around the top. When I first started doing this technique, I would just do only dots inside this tube, and uh, it creates a really cool effect as well. So that might be a good starting point. Now I'm trying to gain a little bit of heat inside this tube again. Since I'm going to take that heat towards the outside of the tube, it's nice to have re regain a little bit of that heat base so you don't get any thermal shocking issues. Now I'm going to heat up that uh, the end of the tube, and I'm going to marver it shut. And I usually don't marver it quite that much. I'm really sucking a lot of heat out of that. I think I was going for the shot again, the video shot. So typically I'll just take one pass at it. And again, I'll let the heat do all the work on this, um, trying to let it just kind of flow into place. But I don't all the way close that tube yet. I have to open up this handle now. Like I was saying before, you don't want both ends of your tube closed off because then it will try to implode. So now I'm gonna, before I lose my heat base, uh, get this little hole nice and hot and then plunge it with a seven millimeter rod and close this off and then try to get an all right termination here where there's not a, a really thick spot. All right, well, that was like the, that was the tricky part right there up to this point. Um, now I'm going to heat up this uh, glass and try to get everything on axis and then gain some sort of a consistency with the thickness of of this piece of glass and so start to melt that pattern work in a little bit so I'll, I'll heat it up and then blow it out a little bit and heat it up and blow it out a little bit Now, as I heat it up and collapse it, I'm really gonna let heat and gravity do most of the work. 
And I remember when I was filming this, a couple times I take it out of the flame. I was, I, when I really make these marbles, I, I do not ever take it out of the flame. Like I wouldn't take it out of the flame right now. It's like, you don't wanna lose that heat base. You want heat and gravity to do most of the work. I think I just was thinking this was really beautiful. And so I wanted to see what this looked like. And at, for a demonstration sake, I wanted people to see how awesome glass is. So keep in mind, if you're making one of these, don't take it out of the flame at this point. You really want to utilize that all that heat base and uh, you want to really go for it. And I, I heat up this glass so much that it's really trying to drip. And so uh, I keep the angle of my hand slightly angled down. So gravity's sort of pulling this downwards. And what you're trying to do is get such a good heat base that uh, as this is collapsing, you will just use a tiny bit of vacuum for the final, final move, and it's pretty quick. It's like you want that white hot to where it's collapsed almost completely, and then you'll pull it out, have your hand angled down, have that glass angled down, and then you'll just give it a little bit of vacuum to finish the job. So that's coming up here pretty quick. There it was, just a little bit of vacuum. And then you kind of regain your composure real quick because that glass is moving and just try to get it on axis. If you were just starting this technique, I would recommend for you to, you know, once you get to about this point where you disconnect this from the tube, I would almost say put it in the kiln and then just do it again and again and get through the process up to this stage before really worrying about how to build this into a marble. And um, these make great pendants too. They The sunlight loves these types of marbles. And if you're doing any sort of like local craft fair or whatever, uh, this sort of a, a design is something that people love, like for bottle stoppers, pendants, little marbles. And uh, there's quite a bit of... A practical use for these techniques too so if you were to just like spend a couple days uh, being production worker getting through the process of making this style uh, you won't regret it and uh, you'll find that there's a, a market for it as well so it'll it'll pay pay for itself no doubt so now I'm just gonna attach my handle to the lens and flame cut this tube off and when I flame cut this tube it's gonna um, leave a, a bubble air bubble and I'll, I'll have to heat up that and remove that as well. And just get this glass nice and hot and then grab it with my tweezers and pull it right off. There we go. And now I'll pull off a little more glass and I'm going for a sort of a, a termination there. Clean up the bottom side of this design since you will see it through the top side of the marble. It was really fun making this video, playing with the different filtration. When that when that glass starts getting white hot, the didymium's just not keeping up, putting shade three and shade five on it, and like right here to, to just allow you to see what's going on in there a little bit more. It's really cool to see this glass in, in ways that you don't get to see it when you're just behind the driver's seat. So, um, so I heated up that, that phantom flower and I paddled it paddled a flat spot and then flame polished that flat spot and now I'm going to apply some cobalt this is just regular north star cobalt get a little gathering of this cobalt and try my best to attach it to the bottom of this marble on center and evenly without trapping any little weird seams or bubbles and now I'm gonna heat this up and, and paddle it in a little bit. The 
flame polish. And now I'm going to apply a heavy, really heavy gold fuming to this. It's what gets that reflective, gold reflective back. But what also happens is when the sunlight goes through the phantom flower side of the marble, it's going to go through that cobalt and the light's going to bounce off that gold back through the front of the marble again. And it just lights up. It just looks electric when it's in the sunlight. And it's, it's a really, really cool effect. So even if I was going to um, have a totally opaque back side of this marble to put a splash of gold behind that cobalt to allow give that that light something to reflect off of and come back uh it's it's a really cool effect so now i'm just keeping that that marble close to the flame so it stays warm but i'm not putting it in the flame because i'm not trying to mess up that that application of the gold and i'm getting a gathering of i believe it's 15 millimeter clear rod and it's going to be nice and hot and i'm going to with one motion attach this hot glass over that gold. Um, you cannot stutter when you're pushing this on. It's gotta be one seamless motion. Gotta really commit to it. And to be honest with you, I can't get that, that shiny gold reflection every single time. I don't think I made enough of them to really learn the exact nuances to it. It was about 50-50 rate for me to, to get a, a real mirror finish. Um, so there's, you know, practice, practice, practice. So now I'm going to heat this clear in. Let heat do a lot of the work before I take it into the marver. If you guys have any questions about any of this, definitely hit me up in the comments below. I'll be happy to try to help you guys out if you're if you're trying to figure this out. It's a tricky marble, it really is. All right, so now we have the basic phantom flower all made. Um, this marble right here is really beautiful on its own, but uh, back in these days, I was all about the the layered dots and. Um, so that's what I do here now is do some backing with these layered dots. So I'm going to start by applying, this is North Star Caramel. I usually always would like to start with a caramel layer if what's inside the glass is dark. And since I used a cobalt in there, I think of caramel as like a contrast to that cobalt. So I do one layer of dots or one row of dots and then another smaller row of dots above that in between. And now I'm gonna just melt these dots in a bit I'm not trying to melt them in all the way smooth, but I'm just trying to melt them in to be nice, even little bumps to give me a good platform for my next row of dots or my next layer of dots, I should say. Definitely not the most even in proportion dots there. All right, so this is a North Star Turbo Cobalt. And so kind of along the lines of you know, I put the caramel over regular cobalt for contrast. Now I'll put turbo cobalt over the caramel because those two colors contrast really well. Also, both of these colors handle getting blasted by heat. So they're really great colors to work with as a beginner. Uh, so you don't have to worry about frying them out. All right, so a layer of turbo cobalt. Now, same thing. I'm going to just hit these with the heat, melt them in 
round them. I'm not going to melt them in all the way. I'm going to round them out a little bit and uh, leave myself little bumps to guide me from my my next layer. And it's extra important to leave a little texture on these because I'm going to put a pretty heavy layer of fuming over these, and then I have to apply another layer of dots. And uh, if I melt these in all the way smooth, then I'm not going to have anything. It's going to be really tough to get my next layer on. So anyways. Also, it's just a completely different effect whether or not you melt in those those dots all the way before you put your next layer of dots or if you leave a little bit of texture on there. Um, for better or worse, it's all just a little different. So I recommend for you to explore explore all that eventually. All right, so this is a really heavy layer of gold. And then I'm going to do a really light splash of silver. And now I'm going to take a clear rod and put, encase that fuming with clear on the, the first row of dots. Notice I'm keeping the marble out of the flame. I'm trying to not even let the flame splash onto that fuming. So that, that clear rod has to be nice and hot to, to really stick. But... Uh, just trying to not mess with that fuming so that it's consistent with itself. So that's a layer of clear. And then for the next row of dots, I'm using double amber purple. And when you get like turbo cobalt with gold and silver fuming on top of that, and then double amber purple on top of that, again, you get this really cool thing where uh, light will go through that double amber purple and hit that that fuming and bounce back and it adds this certain like vibrancy to double amber purple which is an awesome color on its own but when you put double amber purple over uh, fuming it, it's this really nice subtle beautiful quality so now I'm going to melt these in um, most of the way I'm also have a, a pretty oxidizing flame, and I'm I'm trying to burn off any of the residual uh, fuming that hasn't been hasn't been encased with with either clear or that double amber purple, and so now you can kind of see some of that fuming burning off. Got to kind of attack it. All right, so now what I'm going to do, because I have these like little air traps in that bottom row of dots, so I'm going to heat it up with a pinpoint flame and take a, a tungsten probe, and I'm going to probe little divots in this, this bottom row of dots. This is, of course, classic uh, bead-making technique. I think... Uh, you know, early marble making for me, I put a lot of work into trying to figure out the decoration of what would be considered, you know, the top of the marble or the front of the marble. And then my fallback for decorating the backside was usually like dots, uh, layered dots, and then uh, air traps and pinwheels and all of this, uh, which the bead making community had been experimenting with these techniques for forever. Um, I mean, layered dots go back like it predates american glass blowing that's for sure by by a lot all right so now i'm going to take a rod of clear and i'm going to start putting dots over over those divots and trapping little little air pockets
And now I'm going to heat it up, melt those in. I want to um, allow this marble to gain so much heat that all those little trapped air pockets go perfectly round. Um, that tells me that there's not a lot of stress locked in there. And because uh, by, by heating up those, those dots and plunging them with that tungsten probe, you're uh, pretty much abusing the glass. And so uh, trapping air bubbles in there, when, when those air bubbles go nice and round, that's, that's a good indicator that the glass is happy and you don't have a bunch of unnecessary stress locked in there. So now I'm going in with my marver and, and making this marble round. So, so with this marble, and at the beginning of this, that whole liability disclaimer, it was also a disclaimer on saying like, it was basically saying, this is not really an instructional video. This is a demonstration video. And I figured anybody who's goofing around with this technique um, probably already knows the basics on how to use uh, a marble mold. And so I wasn't really focusing on, on you know, how to use a marble mold. And I actually, you know, I go into the, the Marver quite a bit more than it shows on, on this video. And um, I just sort of edited it to make it look like miraculously. I, I made this thing round like really super quickly because it's boring to watch. But uh, anyways, if you have any questions, let me know. All right, so now I'm going to attach my handle on this back side. Marble is warm, tip of the punty is hot. I'm gonna touch down. This is a very sensitive attachment there. It's a cold seal, it's made to pop off, but that's that's one of the one of the necessary skills of a marble maker for sure is getting that last handle um, attached well enough to hold for the final shaping, but not prematurely release. And uh, hopefully, when you pop off that last handle, it doesn't leave a chunk of the handle left on the marble or take a chunk of the marble with it, so you can flame polish it to perfection, hopefully. So I just removed um, all of what would have been the other handle off that lens. I don't even leave the smallest little dot of the handle. It, lots of times it will show up when the marble's cool. So always make sure to get all of the, the punty handle off that lens. I usually always, with marbles too, make sure my final polish is on what would be considered the backside of the marble or at least wherever it's not gonna be a focal point of the marble, just in case. All right, final shaping of that lens. Final flame polish of the lens. have to sort of wait for wait for that heat to escape out of that marble a bit. You don't want to be too hasty about getting it in into that mold because you'll actually mark the lens if it's not cool enough. And then you'll notice I keep it moving when I first put it in that mold. And right now what's happening is that graphite is sucking a lot of heat out. I actually I actually keep it spinning in that marble mold quite a bit more than that to, to remove more of more heat than I showed in this video. And then I just popped it off with my butter knife, just a little tap and the weight of the marble releases. And then I flame polish that last little punty mark, inspect it using the reflection of the light and put it in the kiln, which that was a room temperature marble put in a kiln that wasn't turned on just for the sake of the video. So there we go. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. 
And if you have any questions at all, hit me up in the comments below. Uh, that does it for this episode of the Marblehead Show. If you like where this show is heading, please subscribe to the channel. Your subscription does make a difference. It lets me know people are watching, and it uh, it fuels me to make more. Uh, thanks, everyone. Till next time. On the torch again, like a band of gypsies, we go down the highway.